Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 77 of the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Uh, today, the title of our, our show is Stress, Burnout, and Traumas, Why Helping Organizations Are Unique. So um, I got Kurt with me today. Uh, Jerry's a little bit under the weather, which is kind of a bummer because the weather here in Denver is uh, uh, kind of making that churn, which means we'll probably get four feet of snow next week. March Madness is on. Maybe he's just ditching us, Kurt. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think the games start yet. So we recorded this pretty golfing. Awesome. He could yeah. be on golfing. So, so yeah, I think, you know, the three of us, we've all probably played a little hooky one time or the other <laughs> to, to watch the games. Uh, but it's Kurt, it's Kurt and I today, and, and we're going to have a, a discussion that I really think as we talk about trauma-informed workplaces – trauma-informed leadership will really help uh, inform a lot of what we've talked about and what we'll talk about in the episodes. And that's looking at things like vicarious and secondary trauma. We haven't really defined those concepts. Um, on, on the show, we've gone 77 episodes without really taking a, a deeper look at that. But I want to sort of explore today with Kurt about how we, we look at this and, and how this informs our management leadership, how we think about trauma-informed organizations. So um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. As always, we start out with bright, shiny objects of the week. Um, I'll, I'll start, I guess, some new swag. Um, Project Acts, uh, Act uh, is uh, some friends of mine. I, I've worked with them, I think, for four or five years now um, in uh, Cleveland. So I, I was out there... Uh, Last week, I, I, had a, I had a great trip. I was um, working with a ministry, uh, so I stayed at a nunnery for the first time in my life. Uh, the, the women were amazing. I uh, had a great experience out there, um, outside of Youngstown, and then uh, I drove up to Cleveland and worked with my friends from the school district. So I also have some family out there. So uh, I want to thank them for, for the swag, wearing it with pride today. Um, also, I'll just throw a small one in there. I'm uh, sort of fresh off a long weekend of uh, snowboarding up in the mountains. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's so, uh, I grew up in sort of the Midwest where you never really wanted to be outside in the wintertime. And I don't know, there's just something about being up in the mountains, uh, you know, being outside. We, we call it what we, uh, the days I had were bluebird skies, which in Colorado, it's hard to imagine looking up and seeing a deeper shade of blue. Like it's just this gorgeous, pure blue uh, sunshine. And so, yeah, I've got a little uh, uh, buzz still left uh, from that great trip. So I uh, got a lot of great runs in, got a lot of great weather, hanging with some friends. So uh, uh, feeling good. March Madness starts today. It, it's good. Weather's good. Basketball's good. The snowboarding was good. So. Um, uh, what, Kurt, what about yourself? Man, I don't know if I can top your good news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, if, 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 if anybody's watching on the video, I am wearing my Auburn Tigers hat and their game is at 1130 today. <laughs> yeah. So I'm super excited about that. We can have a different discussion about whether or not they got hosed by the selection committee, all of that kind of March madness stuff. <laughs> it's going to be a great tournament. I'm really excited about it. I love this time of year. I love the. I mean, I'm such a sucker for the underdog, right? Yeah. It's so fun to just watch and see how far that one team can go. Exactly. Love the story. Love rooting for the underdog. I'm always that way. So I just love this time of year. And same, the weather is just wonderful. It's turned and, you know, yeah. we're going to get two more storms. And Yeah, exactly. It'll, it'll be great. <laughs> uh, I am enjoying the springtime today for sure. Awesome. So yeah, and I'll uh, wear black for the Boilermakers today too. So uh, it's 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 a tough year for uh, Indiana when we only get one team in. But so I've got I've got all my no Notre Dame, no IU, no Butler. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty uh, tight. Uh, you know, for, for us, uh, Washington got more in than we did, which uh, I don't know what's going on. I got to visit my home state and kick them into gear. So, uh, down year. 
I and know. One of the fun stories already has been the head coach for Belmont, who had to play into the tournament. Yeah. Been coaching for 33 years. It was 805th win, which is yeah. incredible. And it's his first tournament win. I mean, that, yeah. I love those kind of stories. I yeah. just think it's awesome. And I, I can say with some pride is I went three and one against him because we, <laughs> we played them uh, when I was at, when I was playing in college. So uh, I, I, won't, I won't talk about how they were in quite division one at that point or not, sure. but, but sure. Well, well, we digress. Let, I mean, let, I, just, if we start telling stories better. about Matt's glory days uh, playing basketball, it, it's a whole different podcast. So. The story just keeps getting better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, so I kind of want to uh, start out today, um, and, and I'll, I'll kind of lead us off here uh, about really just looking at, at putting some definitions out there, because we're, we're, we're doing this whole series on trauma-informed workplaces, trauma-informed leadership, with sort of the assumption that uh, when, when, when we're dealing with trauma and the emotional labor of trauma, and we'll, we'll talk about even the trauma of dealing with trauma, um, that, that it requires us to look at leadership and organizational culture and our teams in a slightly different way. And, and I, I, I want to just set up about why I think um, this is a very important thing to put some definitions around. And, you know, one of my thinkings uh, around this is, is really the, the idea of this empathetic intensity. And I really see this and, and emotional labor is, is maybe just another way to describe it, but it's really more specific to the pain and suffering that we expose ourselves to on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, I think about my work as a therapist, working in uh, therapeutic milieus, residential care, school programs. And, you know, whether we're hearing a traumatic story or whether we're dealing with a trauma that's going on in a family's life or, or an individual's life, or whether we just see the behaviors that, that we know are coming out of trauma, um, that's a really powerful thing. We've talked several times that, you know, social scientists see um, emotions as being contagious. And it doesn't mean just because you're getting paid to do work that that stops. Um, and, you know, so, so there's this empathetic intensity that, that really, I, I don't think we talk enough about that this going to work in a helping organization is a different experience. Um, um, it's different from that emotional perspective. And then on the other side, there's just a whole lot of stress that goes into our work as well. Um, oftentimes our agencies are under resource. So um, rarely do I hear, you know, our caseload size has just dropped over the last couple of years. And this is great. We're getting paid more and our workload has decreased dramatically. I, I rarely ever hear that um, in my travels around the country uh, working with different systems. And so, so when we talk about the empathetic intensity and the stress, um, for stress, I, I imagine most of our listeners are familiar with the concept of burnout. Um, and most folks in the helping professions, public health, education who listen to our podcast, we always seem to fall into the top 10 uh, uh, occupations for burnout. Police are also up there. Dentists are up there. Uh, but, but we're always up in that top 10. Um, and one of the reasons I think, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Kurt, after I throw some of the, the definitions out here is, you know what, I think when we're measuring and we get into the top 10, um, one of the reasons is because when we, people historically measure burnout, they're also measuring things like secondary and vicarious trauma. And just to put my definitions around those, and I, I don't think the field has necessarily come into concrete definitions of these. I, I, you can maybe have heard different things of these, which I, I'd love it if we kind of said, okay, this is what vicarious, this is what secondary trauma is. But for me, vicarious trauma is that empathetic intensity and emotional labor really that's involved in walking through a traumatic experience with somebody. I mean, I imagine most of our listeners, they're working with uh, families or kids or adults who are going through a traumatic event or the aftermath, immediate aftermath of a traumatic event. Um, and so I like to say when we're the ones sort of holding uh, and someone we care about and we're working with, when they're in hell and we're the ones kind of helping them, holding their hand through that experience, uh, we can also be in hell with them. And there's been some diagnostic evidence that we can be diagnosed for post-traumatic stress disorder with the only cause of our trauma being the work that we do. 
Um, there's also some brain scan evidence uh, that, of that trauma as well being transferred. Um, secondary trauma for me is a little bit different. To me, this is an immediate trigger of trauma. So if we have maybe something unresolved in our own past or there's something about the situation that creates a traumatic reaction within ourselves, um, or we get re-traumatized. I use secondary trauma to, to put the label on that. I don't think the labels really matter. I just, I just think I know when I've experienced some things like this in my career, I just thought there was something very wrong with me um, until I, now I have labels to put on my experience and realize that I was just a caring human being in the field. So, uh, you know, so we have this stress, we have this burnout, we have this empathetic intensity with secondary and vicarious trauma. And Kurt, I just kind of wonder, you know, I know I think a lot about this because um, I do a ton of self-care trainings for folks, but I just kind of wonder how the, the idea, we kind of talked about the emotional labor, which is part of this. How, how does like the, the dangers of working with trauma on a day in day basis inform your thinking about leadership, team health, worker health, and the, the kind of that wide range of uh, the culture and those pieces as well. <clears throat> as you were describing, the, the different terms of burnout, compassion fatigue pops into my head. Some of these yeah. kind of terms um, where my, my, my head was going just in terms of really simple underlying concepts that, that I think drive a lot of these are the ideas of sensitization and tolerance hmm. in our stress response. So you can think about sensitization, which is the definition of that is a larger than normal response to normal level stimulation. Uh, you may get that may be a sign of burnout that may be a sign of secondary trauma like you can have a, a big reaction to something that can be just a part of your normal work world mm -hmm. and i think there you know there are lots of examples of that right you can have you know like uh, many staff that i have seen uh, that have had to be involved in the use of physical restraint which can be very unpleasant and sometimes you have to do it to keep people yes. safe um even seeing it creates an, an autonomic response and it can almost paralyze them. They get a huge response to it or they over-engage in it. Mm -hmm. and th so there's, there's a part of that that I think we could get real nuanced about what these things are yeah. um, when we start to understand the underlying mechanisms. And then you have the idea of, of tolerance or not responding to things that you ought to be responding to. And so if there's a work task in front of you that great, I should be organized by that. I should get it done and I don't. That's another side of this kind of balance of our physiology um, that's indicative of burnout, fatigue, some of those kinds of things. So I think they kind of hit on two things. One, and you were mentioning it, right? There's the idea of, of a, um, some kind of trauma trigger or an event in our environment that gets us really overactive and having a sensitized response to something. And then the other side, which is the fatigue part of the uh, part of the under response to things. I think both sides of those play into how we talk about secondary trauma and vicarious trauma being triggered and compassion fatigue and burnout. Um, yeah, I, th that's some of my thoughts, certainly, as I think about, to the concept of the uh, circumplex model of affect, where we think about affect being organized by energy, high or low energy, and pleasantness, high or low pleasantness. Burnout is low energy, low pleasant side of that right and mm -hmm. and and then secondary trauma or being triggered is on the high energy unpleasant side of it and both of those become emotional states that are problematic for our biology and our physiology if we're just in those environments over and over repeatedly that becomes a very chronic situation so yeah. the second part of your question is like how do I, how do i let that organize how i think mm -hmm. in terms of culture and design and things like those so Certainly there are things about that that I think about from a large scale perspective. So as you think about how we design an organization, um, especially the welcoming part of an organization are really important for that. If we're working in a space, market space, essentially where people who come to work for us are likely to have worked for other organizations where they have been exposed to vicarious trauma and all of these like they're, they're probably switching and the probability that they are switching from one organization to another 
being driven by secondary trauma, burnout, chronic fatigue is really high. Yeah. So thinking about the welcoming part of how you welcome a new person into your organization, I think about it as this is a person who probably has some kind of activated physiological arousal that they need safety, they need relational like interconnection, and all of those things are really important in your onboarding process. Mm -hmm. So I think about it at that scale. Yeah. I also think about it on a moment to moment, this person sitting in front of me who I'm supervising or this person sitting in front of me in a meeting who is acting a certain way and maybe is confusing to me. I think about it in terms of what kind of chronic stressors is this person exposed to currently, historically, and how do I help to regulate this person? Yeah. Uh, in, in moment to moment interactions, whether that be in supervision, whether that be in meetings. So it guides my own personal interactions with people when I'm doing well. <laughs> and when I get overly stressed out, it's harder for me to do that. Um, and also from an organizational, like organizational practices standpoint, how do we share information effectively with people? How do we welcome people? How do we create relational connections with people? Um, those kinds of things really play into, into how I think about a department or a culture and an organization. Yeah, and it's just to, to me it, when I really got into to the the work of thinking about trauma informed care, and then you know starting to do trainings on it, it just it really just struck me as I think you know there there's there's sort of this business you know, and I, I think we we would do a lot. We would be well served by making sure that every manager in the helping professions had some training on how to be a manager. Because um, I don't think that the, a lot of times the skills translate. I, I often say, you know, I had three years of graduate education to be a therapist. Um, somebody just promoted me six months into my career to be a supervisor. Yeah, you were being a therapist. You get yeah, did, yeah you get exactly. Uh, I, was, I was doing therapy with yeah. him. And, and you do that, a job that you don't know how to do. Exactly. And, and you know, so, so it was this, it was just really immediate in my, my career at about 22 is like, I got struck of, wow, how sophisticated management was. And, and you know, and so it's like, you know, but, but appreciate it. I think sometimes we, we fall into this thing, okay, we've got to get this done. And I totally agree that you got to get things done. If you're not getting anything done, you, you know, you're not, you're not doing anything for anybody. Um, and we're trying to kind of plug in the right pieces to do that thing in a quality way. And I think sometimes we can get so caught up in getting things done that, that none of us along the way sometimes can, can stop to appreciate the impact of getting that thing done, which is oftentimes hearing tra traumatic stories after traumatic stories, um, you know, seeing uh, the, the impact of, of some horrific stuff like sexual abuse and physical abuse and all those things that I know uh, we've dealt with so often, if not on a weekly, a daily basis um, in our careers. And it's just, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I sort of got the, the trauma informed piece fairly early on in my career because immediately I started to shift my initial focus to, okay, how do I keep my staff healthy? Um, how do I set up, you know, and, and acknowledging that like I, my friend Deb Bourne says in San Francisco, it's the fire we signed up to walk into. So there's a reality that if you, you know, you, you're deciding to do this work, you know, you know, you're going to work with some of this stuff, but you know, it doesn't mean you're going to stay healthy. And I, I think, and I'd, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on this too. What, what I worry about is I, I see so many people damaged by the work. Um, you know, I, I kind of work off this four stages of burnout where it starts with exhaustion, goes to guilt and shame. And I think a lot of times we hit, stage two pretty quickly because most everybody I ask is, hey, do you agree you need to be at your best every day to do this work effectively? And nobody ever disagrees with that. But when we're doing work where, where in some cases, I would argue lives are at stake. Now, if you're a, a nurse or a physician, you know, it may be an actual life, but also getting people connected to resources, giving them that support, you know, our empathy, our compassion, our, our those, the, that relationship is such a key thing. So when we know they need us to be here and we're only able to do here because of our exhaustion, which is, an, I think, just a natural part of our work, 
we kick into that guilt and shame quicker than anybody else. And then that third stage of cynicism and callousness, I see this everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I see this as especially high up in leadership um, uh, around the country. And I also see great leaders in my travels as well. Don't get me wrong, but, but there's this, there's this hardness that can kind of creep in. Um, and then the fourth stage is crisis where, you know, I've had people say my marriage broke up because of work stress. Um, well, the one that really gets me is I'm not the mom or dad I want to be because I'm so stressed out at work. And so here, I just want to step back and appreciate, here are people who dedicate their life to the service of others in their community, at least their professional life, and yet I hear over and over again that that dedication has a real cost to their personal health, well-being mm -hmm. as well. And I, you know, the more I think in my career is, as I kind of evolve and, and connect with higher and higher people in different systems, you know, the more I, I see people really struggling to to keep that empathy, to keep that compassion. And if the head loses it, the body often follows. And that's, you know, you can kind of see this trans, you know, uh, impact whole systems of care as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's, those are poignant stories, right? I mean, to think about your, your, your description is, is really kind of, uh, it's something to really think about of people who have dedicated their lives to helping others and that that dedication destroys them. And, and really, yeah. like, I mean, that's I'm, I'm one thing that I remind myself of is how grateful I am to live in a society where I can make a living doing this. Yeah. Right. But not every society has this. No. And, and that's pretty incredible to be a part of that. And I also think one of the major challenges that we have is the way that our stress response is developed doesn't quite fit with our world yet. Mm, tell me and about that. In the sense that we respond to things in a relative sense. Mm -hmm. And so we respond to things as if they are threats in a relative way. Right? There aren't any tigers chasing us. There aren't bears chasing us every day, but our stress response still responds to events that happen in our environment and it's organized that way. That's the way it functions. Yeah. It goes up and it goes down and it can kind of go a sideways way. You know, like there's, there's the polyvagal side of it can go yeah. another way. Right. So when we think about what gets us stressed out about work, it's often rarely is it actual crisis, mm -hmm. but we respond to it as if. It, it is crisis. And so that, I, that's a quick lead into, I think, those stages. I th and that's a nice way of, of thinking about it, that you travel through, I'm stressed. Because, you know, like one of the things I tell a lot of, a lot of my clinicians is in this, in this business, mm -hmm. nobody calls because things are going well. <laughs> right, exactly. That's not the business that in we're fact, in. fact, we discharge them when they're doing well, right? And then you, so, you get somebody else who's not doing so well. And exactly. That's what we do. So that's yeah. our business. <laughs> and that's hard. Yeah. And that's really difficult in that we're always getting a call because something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. which is an automatic setup into the pressure to make it go right and the pressure to fix and to repair. And, and always, I mean, think about times in, in kind of your own life of when things seemed really dire, when you were really under some pressure and you're really like, I, I don't know, I don't know any of us who haven't gone through bouts of at least a little bit of depression, probably some pretty, pretty moderate anxiety. I mean, that's just kind of prevalent in our society, yeah. you know? Um, those, those moments in time, they can seem really scary. Mm -hmm. Like they can seem like that, like, it, like survival is at stake. Right. Even though I have enough food on the table, even though like, you know, I have a car, I can drive it to work. Like, that, that's just a part of kind of what we do. So as you think about how our stress response impacts our brain, and things getting organized by a chronic crisis, even when maybe it's not actual life or death crisis, it still feels that way. So we respond to things at work um, in terms of like when people do things where it steps on our toes, mm -hmm. right? We feel a threat and our threat response gets activated. And that chronic activation of that threat response, this isn't even just true of only human services. Like this is, 
every workplace yeah. is like this. Yeah. And so if we think about, go back to our kind of talk about emotional labor, emotional management, emotional intelligence, why affect matters in organizations. Like that's getting generated over and over and over and over again. Even if you're working at McDonald's, right. like that's getting generated. And it, our argument here is that it's a little more intense when the people coming to you are coming to you because their life is not going well. Mm -hmm. right. Rather than, I need a hamburger. Exactly. But they're, they're exactly. Just, it's a level of need, right? That is yeah. somewhat different. And you could make an argument that it's more intense. And I certainly don't want to minimize the experience of people who don't work in human services, because I think that they deal with different things that are probably equally as challenging. You know, I haven't worked outside of human services yeah. for many years, so... Um, but I have a lot of friends who do. Yeah. But they tell me about work, and it's not that much different in terms of work relationship. Right. And the stressors that are put on people and the chronic things of, we have to get this done right now, and this is a crisis. And it, the, from a leadership standpoint, um, you probably learned this from Jerry, too. Like, one of the things he taught me early on was to say, how much time do I have to make this decision? That's your mm -hmm. first question. Yeah. Well, like, do I need to do this right now because somebody is not safe or do I have time? And if I have time, then I'm going to ask some more questions. Yeah. So I see that just played out in human services, outside of human services, um, you know, all over. Our brains get organized by solving the problem right here and now without thinking about how much time we have to solve the problem. And which allows you to ask other questions like, what resources do I have? Yeah. How do I, you know, how do I allocate those resources to this problem? Anyway, that's some kind of, those are just some free kind of free flowing thoughts. As yeah. We we're discussing it. Um, but, you know, you really see young clinicians. I, I, I love training them. I love kind of mentoring young clinicians and supervising them because they have, they give me energy. Yeah. They're so energetic. And so I feed off of that. And, and I really appreciate that part of the, the experience. And I also get a little protective about them mm -hmm. where I look at, you know, people who are down the road in their careers a little bit. And if I see them kind of mistreating some of my, some of my young clinicians, I get a little Papa bearish about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I think, that certainly the idea of vicarious trauma and how we treat one another in work situations, especially when we're trying to help a vulnerable person, uh, I think is just really critical. And I certainly wish that uh, we could get more of a widespread understanding of people managing their feelings and managing the, the intense emotions that come up. Yeah. Again, people have some sensitized responses to certain things and you see that play out in all kinds of interactions, all kinds of meetings where suddenly the urge to retaliate has become strong and it's not necessarily related to the current context. Right. And that confuses everybody around them. Everybody's yeah. like, what just happened here? Right. Why, why did this person attack me? I don't get it. Yeah. I don't know what I did. Well, and I think that, that if we can get the understanding, the, the other piece of research that I found really helps me view, view our work in, in a different light is, is there's been some research done of what takes, you know, what causes stress to become more impactful on us in a negative way. Like what takes, I like to think, what, what's, I mean, we, we deal with stress, good stress, you stress, bad stress, whatever. I mean, stress is why you get out of bed in the morning, right? We, our cortisol peaks in the morning to get our butts out of bed uh, uh, and wake up. And, and so there, there's always stress. But I found it interesting because it really helps me think about our job. And, and there's three things that I saw in this research. One was, um, which, which I don't think, I think exists in every workplace, is duration of the stress. Um, you know, we deal with things. I think everybody deals with The work's never done. Um, I think sometimes our duration around things like homelessness, uh, uh, school reform. I mean, some of the, especially through our advocacy works, it seems like we're trying to climb unclimbable mountains at times and sort of working against our community, which I, I think is in its own way a weird dynamic where we're trying to help people and we feel like the policies of our community actually can do damage. But the other two are what I really paid attention to. And that's what we saw, and this can lead what a stress to a traumatic event as well is 
uncertainty and importance. And I think those are the kickers for us. And I really thought a lot about these two things because we, I think in a lot, if you look at, let's just say fast food again, or any restaurant or any, uh, I think consumer thing is, your customer's important to you. But, but it's usually maybe a brief interaction. It right. usually might be even in a business realm. And I see this with my clients because it's what you should do. We, we kind of stay here for the most part. Now, I've gotten to know people. I call them work friends, uh, which are really just my friends um, in this field. And we get to know each other a lot deeper. But there's sort of a surface relationship going on. And I think when you get to know people uh, the way we get to know people, uh, um, that uh, they become very important to us. And, and sometimes our success is measured on how well they do too. Uh, it's not on how many kind of hamburgers we sell or microwaves we, you know, or, or how much code we write. You know, their well-being and life outcomes are sometimes how we measure our own success. And then I think the real kicker in all this is the uncertainty piece of it. Because, you know, where I think our stress is slightly different. Well, I, well let me say dramatically. I, I, I'm not going to throw slightly out there. It, and, and, and again, I think everybody's experience of stress is relative. So people are burned out in all professions. But, I mean, there's people that can go through their entire life never worrying about somebody that they care about might go commit suicide. Right. Uh, you know, and I'm sure both of us have done plenty of suicide assessments in our time. And, you know, it's hard not to freaking take that home with you. Um, you know, that, that we oftentimes, you know, I, I just, you know, go into uh, sort of the, the epicenter of, of the opiate crisis, you know, that, that some folks, you know, that the majority of their caseloads are struggling with is an addiction and they're worried how many people are going to overdose. Not is anybody going to overdose in our community, but how many people are going to die this weekend and are any of those people going to be on my caseload? Um, and so there, there's this, again, we, we think about that, that we care deeply um, through our empathy, through our compassion, just through being human beings. And then there's such a level of uncertainty of, Sometimes is this person going to be alive so we can meet again? Um, I think those calls to child protective services, is this kid going to be abused tonight? And did I do everything in my power to stop it? Domestic violence was one that was tough for me is the abuser's not ready to leave, uh, the, or the abusee's not ready to leave, the victim's not ready to leave the abuser. And they're going home tonight to this individual who has put them in life-threatening situations. And you know, that there, I think when we think about the intensity of our work, it's powerful. The fact that we're not all, if, if emotions are contagious, that we're not all in that cynicism and crisis stage is somewhat in its own right to me a miracle. Uh, because I really can't, when you put all the research together, individuals who, you know, are exposed to trauma on a daily basis should take those emotions on themselves. And I think sometimes we do. That's why we have the vicarious secondary trauma, those, those compassion fatigue, that language. Um, so in some ways I'm like, wow, we should maybe even be more screwed up than, than we really are. Uh, <laughs> and I'm just trying to put the science pieces together yeah. here. It's no, I think we're incredibly resilient. There, there's something about us to go into this field, but man, you, you put some of this emotions are contagious, behaviors are contagious. I've never seen any study done. Um, you know, Jim Rohn has a, a great, I think the statement's too simplified for the research, but, but just a great way to sum up that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, and we could get into social networks and everything, but are, are clients one of those five for us? Are they two of those five for us? There's something in there um, with that. So I just learned to appreciate it's 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 so powerful work that it's amazing that we are as healthy sometimes as we are. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about um, the title of a book, not not even the content of the book. But the title of the book is "The Power of Disconnection," mm. and just think I, I I don't even remember what the content of this book was about, but I'm just remembering the title about how part of the way that we manage those kind of difficult feelings is to dissociate from them or disconnect yes. from them. Right? Yeah. And so if you think about 
what drives disconnection. It can be intentional and it can be unintentional. Mm -hmm. right? If it's unintentional, then it's driven by, usually driven by affect. I, if it's like if it's you and it's the intolerable yeah. affect that gets generated by chronic exposure to yeah. adverse childhood experiences and you get the like your your physiology is then driven to create intolerable affect that usually is organized around feelings of there's not going to be enough of something or I'm going to run out of something or I'm going to get threatened or I'm going to get hurt or I need to retaliate against something. Yeah. Right. So those are the basics of, of what kind of emotions get generated you dissociate from those because they're unpleasant and just like being aware of those all the time is really difficult. When we get into like being a clinical services provider and you're exposed to all those emotions all the time, you start to disconnect from them. And one of the stories that I hear people start to tell themselves about why they disconnect is because they stop caring. Yeah. Which is a way of being affectively driven in your disconnection. Mm -hmm. not cognitively driven and intentional in your disconnection. And that's a pretty nuanced thing. Yeah. Like this is, I mean, this is where I think mindfulness is so helpful. And some of these practices where you learn to be intentional about being open to an affective experience and being not open to an affective experience. And I feel negative things. So I just do things to manage that and get away from it versus mm -hmm. I do things to cope my way through it. Like those are kind of yeah. basic concepts, right? But not well understood and not well learned by right. people. And honestly, like I'm not that great at it sometimes. Right. Well, when I, I think, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, I think it's a gradual process as well. It's not like on a Monday, right. you're compassionate, you're empathetic, and on Tuesday, you don't, you're done, right? Now, it, I mean, that's why I like the concept of secondary trauma because we can have that, we can have that sort of reaction that leaves us disoriented, but I, I see this, this dissociation just kind of, you know, it, it brings up that, that idea of, you know, boiling a frog, you know, that, that the, if you turn up the heat just gradually, the frog will just sit in the hot water right, thinking right. it's a, a spa and eventually die. Uh, it doesn't realize the, and I, I think in some ways that what I see is, because I don't know about you, but I find very few people going into this field whether they're young or whether it's a second career that I don't just love like you talk about the young I mean they, they, rarely do I see somebody new to the field who I'm like saying oh man this person needs to get out of here it's happened but the majority of people go into this field with their hearts kind of wide open yeah. and ready for this and yet I, again, I, I think that almost the dangerous thing is not Monday or Tuesday so as a supervisor sometimes if this happens over the course of a couple years, I'm kind of like the frog in the water too, is I might not, especially if I'm not mindful, if we don't have supervision, that we can find ourselves in that, that kind of system. So I like to say our heart becomes a concrete monument to who we once were uh, when we hit that stage. But I see, do you see that kind of happen? Does the frog analogy make any sense? Yeah, no, I think it's a good analogy. You look around suddenly and the water around you is boiling. You're like, well, shit. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> time to get a new job where I'll continue to boil in my right. same juices. Time yeah. to change the address of the problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I do see that. And it, it's, I, I think your point about good supervision is really really helpful just even from either whether from a supervisory standpoint or from a clinical practitioner standpoint um one of the things that we can offer to other people is a point of view of not being in the situation absolutely directly you know and that's just a, an important thing to do and be able to offer to somebody you sometimes you do it well sometimes you don't um, and the more that you practice and get intentional about it, the, the better you can get at that kind of thing and connecting with other people's experience and then offering them uh, at least, I think this is one of the great things about MI is, is uh, asking questions to lead in a certain direction and, 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 yep. um, and shape certain things. Like I think, guiding, yeah. yeah, I think it's great, but man, I, yeah, I see that a lot and it is very gradual mm -hmm. and can happen so quickly where you don't realize it. And, and that's one of the reasons why I think um, the concept of self-care is both an individual responsibility and an organizational responsibility. Mm -hmm. 
if we just depend on other people to, to quote unquote, take care of themselves, right? It's one of the statements that I actually hear people say, and I'm like, I hate that. <laughs> I hate it when they say, take care of yourself. I'm like, if that were that easy. Like, if yeah. only if, that were, if it were that easy. And that, that's one of the kind of mantles that I hope that I take on as a, as a leader is to take on a portion of that and be able yeah. to say to my staff, I need you to go home. I, yeah. I need you to stop working. You need to stop. You've got to go. And I think that's an important part of, of an organization and our responsibility as good stewards of the people who take care of people. Yeah. I, I think is really important. And I, I take that responsibility really seriously. Yeah. Well, when I think about like, you know, since I, I've just thought very, you know, uh, you know, besides the leadership thing, the self care was like my the second kind of big training in the trauma realm that I was doing. So I've been thinking about this for over a decade now. And I just, you know, I, appreciating what we walk into every day. Again, if you think of porn's duration, uncertainty, that's our job. Uh, we never know what to expect. Neither of us kind of know what the day is really going to be. We may have things on our calendar, but who knows what really happens. Um, and so, you know, what I've appreciated with self-care is it's most of our environments are such emotionally labor intense, emotional labor intensive, uh, empathetic intensity, second vicarious trauma, just the stress of the job is like almost challenging people to think about themselves as an athlete or a musician, but somebody who really needs to prepare themselves to step into the work. Um, and I know the analogy is not a perfect one, but you know, I think about what it would take to keep a brain healthy when you might spend six, eight hours a day, uh, dealing with individuals whose behaviors are a result of traumatic experiences, dealing with their traumatic experiences, just dealing with things. I think in general, I don't think we pay enough attention to this, but working with homelessness when homelessness is not is getting worse in most communities. So every day I go to work trying to help these folks and yet there's two additional people at the door because we, our community doesn't prioritize affordable housing. And, and so, I mean, I try to think about, okay, how do you go into that fire ready to do great work, not just survive the fire, but provide an excellent level of service. And that's one of the things that, you know, so some ways I think about from a neurobiological perspective, what do we know about healthy brains and how can we kind of bring that into our thinking about trauma informed workplaces? And some of that is diet, exercise, and sleep is kind of some of the fundamental things I hear. But it's like, you know, when you talk about the, the stress, we're not being chased by a tiger. You're absolutely right. And yet that can kill us because we're not running away from something. We, right. We're, right. we're sitting in a meeting and the tiger's right next to us, right? Um, and then we go answer emails and the tiger's still there. And we're not, we're not, at least we've run away from a tiger, we're burning off some of that cortisol. And then we sit in traffic and then, you know, and so, I, you know, when you start to think about how do we stay healthy, I, I think that that's that big, that big challenge is how do we have, keep our healthy brains uh, coming into work each and every day to give that compassion, to give that empathy and not have that kind of withdrawal. Or even the other thing I see is an over-identification where we just start to tell people what to do and take control of everything as well. So, you know, and again, just like, are, are we giving people chances to practice to take a 10 minute mindfulness break? Are we get, are we encouraging exercise whether, and it's probably more walking around the block. Um, sort of things because most of us don't have the money to buy a gym for our folks. Um, you know, can we provide healthy food? You know, I think some of the those things are when I think about true trauma informed environments. Are we promoting the behavior that's going to allow that brain to stay healthy amidst all the stress? Yeah, you know, I, I think your point is a really, really great one, right? And we we're talking about like if you if you see danger and you don't run from it, that's that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty dangerous. Right? Yes, Sometimes it is. You yes. need that kind of a response. Yep. Yeah. Zebras don't get ulcers, right? Yeah, right, stress. right. They right. either get eaten or they run away. They just start eating again like nothing happened. <laughs> right. The stress response goes up and then it recovers again. Yep. That's what it's. That's that's how that's how it goes. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. I, and that's, you know, it's an interesting one. I, 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 we have, we're getting, or what, we got like 15 minutes left. So yeah. I, I kind of want to share get a, an experience and get your Go for it. Um, I mean, I, you know, this happened to last week or so. I have a client who has, you know, some pretty significant traumatic experiences that required some legal involvement. And, you know, obviously she was um, taken advantage of in some way. And uh, she got a, a court appointed attorney and a, a, a court appointed um, guardian who are both attorneys. And rightfully so, you know, they wanted to um, get information from us so that they, we could help them do their job and understand, you know, what, how do we, you know, help this person and, you know, this kind of a thing, right? So they reached out to us and asked, can, can we just have a meeting? So we talked about it with our client and our client said, I don't want you to talk to my attorneys, mm. which creates a dilemma, right? Yeah. Like there's like, how do we do that? Right. It would be great if the attorneys could just communicate directly with their client and get whatever information they wanted. Right. But there's a communication problem there. And so they have to kind of go another way to get information, which puts us in a position of, do we yeah. violate patient confidentiality here? Right. Like, how do we, how, so it just creates this great dilemma, right? Yeah. So from my position, I'm like, okay, how we navigate this is really important and we got to be really careful about it so that we don't violate our, the confidentiality with our client, but we also, we're in compliance with what the legal system needs, right? And it's not uncommon. This happens all the time, thousands of times a day, the situation yeah. happens. So, you know, one of the things that happened was um, these attorneys got really upset and really felt like we were being adversarial by, and you know, we, and I get it. Like, yeah, I get their frustration. Yeah. And we were kind of like, we just want to be cautious here. This is the dilemma to, that it creates for us. How should we navigate this? And it was pretty difficult for them to think about that as a question and not just go, here's, here's the court order. You're required to give us everything that we ever asked for. And I'm kind of like, yeah, maybe yeah <laughs> maybe yeah <laughs> but maybe not yeah so you know i was thinking real hard about it and and uh just watching you know emails kind of bounce back and forth and uh this is, is a very young clinician who's on the case and she's very caring and very wonderful and probably not very experienced with dealing with the legal system and they can like yeah. that the part of the legal system is that you make threats and you bully to get people to bend that's to you. Right, the empathy and compassion we shoot for. That's just that's kind of, that's a part of that world. Yes. It, it really is. And I get it and I'm glad that I don't work in it every day. You know? <laughs> I mean my my dad was a judge for twenty five years and that was one of his biggest frustrations, I think, with the legal system. Yeah. He's like, Can you guys just be nice to each other? Like come right. on, come on, let's just have a conversation with one another. Well, you talk, you talk about uh, an occupation that experiences uh, tremendous rates of vicarious trauma. Oh, you can imagine. Never talks about it. Yeah. yeah. That's just how we deal, right? Exactly. Well, well and, you know, there's this interesting concept, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of cautious to use this because I'm going to put I – don't, I don't say the word trauma lightly, and I, I don't want to throw it around so much that, oh, trauma, right? Everything's traumatic, but – you know, you know, there's this concept and I had my first two work experiences were horrible. Like I, I was like, I'm not sure why I'm still in the field because they were so bad. They were so bad. I went and got a master's degree in business administration. <laughs> Get out. I, I needed to find out, am I messed up or so you dissociated? Uh, yeah. You went like, back to I, I school like, as a dissociative response. Yes. I have a cognitive, <laughs> I have a very cognitive response. It's like, that's awesome. Go get a master's degree to figure this that's out. That's awesome. I think we all think that we're like, man, I should have been a statistician. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's like, you know, we had this like trauma bonding going on between the, the workforce the direct care folks and our leadership. Like I, I've seen several mutinies internally where staff have gone to a board of directors to, to try to get the executive director fired. And I, I decide not to be a part of those mutinies. And I don't know, I look back and I wonder if, if that was the right decision or not. I still, I still don't have clarity. I don't feel good that I didn't, but I don't feel good that I wasn't a part of that and supported yeah. my peers. Cause I, 
I, I understood their frustration. Um, but we get so, and I've seen this between, like, like you said, between different professionals. And we, I think one of the things that we lose in all of this stress, and if we lose it, we, we sort of lose our ability to be effective, which I think is we lose kind of our humanity in some way, is that we treat, I, I watch people treat each other in meetings that are running, helping organizations, working with individuals in poverty, homelessness, HIV, child abuse, uh, medical issues, treat each other with so much disrespect. Like, and some, I've been involved now with a few systems for a decade or so. I've watched it play out over 10 years. Yeah. And it's like, we will treat each other without any thought about empathy, compassion. And I don't know what we're doing sometimes. Like, like it's really disheartening to watch sometimes there's just this you would never treat a patient or client that way because i've watched you work with them you hope not and that, yeah and, and then you go to a meeting and you call people names i've seen somebody right. throw something at somebody in a meeting oh, and these are like executive directors level people yeah. and yeah and we we like i and i i think again good people good people i think maybe 20 years ago passionate empathetic compassionate people it got lost along the way. And I, I then get to see it come out in its ugliest points um, of things. So this is why I think when we think about trauma-informed uh, workplaces, cultures, organizations, it's how do we bring this compassion to each other? How, yeah. how do we understand like, you know, that, hey, yeah, that staff might have acted in a totally inappropriate way, but what's going on with that staff, right? Did that just person make a dumb decision in isolation? which happens, but when I do some probing, it happens maybe 5% of the time. 95% of the time, it's they got sick kids at home and they're not sleeping. There's something going on in their personal life. Uh, maybe they experience vicarious and secondary trauma, but don't know how to put a label on their emotional state. And the, these actions are, are coming out. And, and so it's like, you know, to me, it's just like, this is why we need to think. And I, I wish we did this more of, what do you need to do to run a healthy, effective, helping organization? And, and I haven't found that answer. I, I think Dr. Bloom gets to it in her sanctuary model probably closer than most people do. But I think we're expected to take the business literature and apply it to our work. And I, I think we can do that. I've been doing that my whole career. But if we don't stop in the middle and say, okay, However, how does secondary and vicarious trauma, how's our trauma-informed lens uh, uh, inform how we're going to take these business practices into our work? Then those business practices can seem punitive um, or just fail. I mean, I, I wish I had a dollar for every failed strategic plan in the helping uh, professions that I've been a part of that just sit on that desk and collect dust because we all know we should do one. But it's like uh, employee evaluation is another great example. Like, I don't probably think, you know, two-thirds of the helping organizations are ready. They've done some cool research on this to do employee evaluations. The safety, the trust, the, it's not there. And this is, again, business literature that I'm trying to bring into our work. Um, and I watch organizations go through this, and it just blows them up. It's like, what do you mean I'm not a 10 on every, you know, it's just like, there's no emotional capacity left to sit with each other. Mm -hmm. And, and we've got to do that folks. <laughs> like, you know, I think as I was thinking back on this experience with, with these attorneys, one of the, I felt the real, the real dilemma here mm -hmm. from, uh, from like being a leader yeah. and feeling like, I mean, I, one, I stepped in so that I wasn't leaving this brand new clinician just to get eaten by the wolves, right? Like I felt that responsibility. And two, I felt the responsibility to, to set some limits on, some, in some ways, the way that these attorneys were using threats and bullying to get us to do what they wanted them to do. Yeah. So there was both of those needs, right? And there was the need to also understand them because I don't know what their history is. Right. I don't know what's come, you know, like we just barely became involved in this person's life. Yeah. And it actually has taken us several months to get this person to engage in clinical services. And so I'm trying to like, 
understand and ask questions to understand their perspective and understand how I can help to regulate them and also how I can help to protect my clinician, but also teach her and model how to effectively manage a situation that's highly conflict laden and, you know, pretty dramatic. And so there's kind of all of these, all of these different areas that I'm trying to operate in effectively. And in the course of doing that, I lost my cool, mm. right? The, one, the lawyers kept threatening and, and finally I lost it. And I'm on the phone with one of these attorneys and I just, I told her to stop. And I just, <laughs> I told her that if she would like how inappropriate it was that she was using threats. And I said, I mean, she, at one point she had threatened um, with a, a contempt of court. And I was like, you're not a judge. That's really inappropriate. Yeah. If the judge knew that you do that, they might be a little upset with you. You're an attorney. You are not a judge. Wow. And I mean, I went, <laughs> I went from... I'm just, I'm just dumbstruck by what you just said. I went from zero to 60. Oh, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> and so the dilemma there was, I, maybe I needed to do that to set the limit and say, threatening is not okay. Like there's a tiger in the room and you need to do something to make sure that that tiger doesn't eat you. So there's a, there's a part of that was really important. The real challenge there is that I wish that I didn't have to get upset to do it, mm -hmm. right? That's the intentional part of it because I was no longer intentional, right? Right now I was affectively driven and yeah. I was attacking and that wasn't trauma informed. Yeah. Right. I stopped. I, I, and I got overwhelmed, right? I got overwhelmed. I got frustrated. I got angry. I got scared. I got angry. Like you took all of those together. And that I think is really the crux of how hard it is to run a trauma informed organization. It's that managing all those different hats, all those different demands and doing it the very best that you can. Yeah. At least even thinking, how do I do that so that I don't have to get upset to do it? Right, right. And I, I think as, as you can look back at it is if, if you get upset, that's a natural reaction to being threatened with contempt of court. I, I, that still blows me away. But, but being gentle with ourselves too is that our bad days are going to sometimes be ugly. Like now the more we practice mindfulness, the more we eat right, the more we exercise, the more we do the things we know, hang out with people that bring joy into our life. Those, those things that we know really uh, improve our overall health and, and uh, mental health. You know, I think we're able to catch ourselves like you did and say, okay, that was a me at my best. But, but again, be gentle with us is because it, to me, it's amazing that we're not in that space most of the time sometimes. So, <laughs> so I, I think that's a great, you know, and to have that level of insight and because it does, you know, I, I think we all look back and things that we we're not proud of um, with this. And I look back again early in my career where I was young and dumb. If you think I have a lot of energy now. Yeah, I was probably the most annoying person to try to supervise on the planet. But, you know, I look back at it, it's just like, why did we treat each other this way? Yeah. And one of the things I think what I love about your response is, you know, that, that we're not sometimes honest with each other. We're, we're just not like, hey, when you did this at the meeting, this is how it made me, this was my reaction to this. And I don't want to take this back and, and come back with it to the next meeting. Can we, can we talk about it? for a time. And I think I look back and I, the things I wish I'd done differently in my career, I wish I would have had some, I wish I would have caught myself to have some of those, those conversations. Uh, but yeah, I, those are hard, right? Because yeah. we often got the next thing to jump into. Your well. point's a great one that that really is being trauma informed doesn't mean that you never do any of those things. <laughs> exactly. Feelings, right. You, you have them all the time. Yep. Yep. But asking the questions and continually trying to get better at it yes. is really what that, what that pathway is. And it's, it's an incredibly fun and exciting one, and it's a real hard one. It is a really hard one. Absolutely. Well, great discussion today. I want to I thank Kurt and uh, everybody for joining us. Um, as always, you can find show notes, discussion questions, and everything else. Uh, see uh, Kurt's our Auburn hat uh, on uh, traumainformedlens.org. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, when this comes out, everybody will know the results of the game. So I'm sure Auburn will be in the Sweet 16. Right. For you. So uh, I'll, say, I'll say War Eagle for the day. There you go. There you go. And maybe we'll take a podcast of why you have two mascots at that school. But that's for a whole different show. <laughs> Tigers, Eagles, I, isn't one enough. But whole different show. So uh, thanks for joining us. And, and we'll continue our, our conversation on trauma-informed workplaces next week. Thanks, everybody.